welcome or welcome back to TSC Talks. We are the podcast inspired by the condition known as tuberous sclerosis complex, the source cannabinoid. My name is Jill Woodworth and I'm your host. Thank you so much for tuning in. My guest today on the podcast is Kiara Juster. Kiara is the head of government affairs at Oaksterdam University as well as legal counsel for Last Prisoner Project. She hosts High Tea Tuesdays on Oaksterdam University's Instagram page live. And she's just a powerful, passionate individual who did a lot of educating of me personally. She went to law school in Miami, having grown up in Oregon, was in for some culture shock, ended up becoming disillusioned with the system, the lack of prosecutorial discretion, and kind of left the country. Not kind of, she did. Left the country spent years traveling and learning before she returned back resolute to change the laws. We talk a little bit about the Last Prisoner Project and Richard DeLisi, so she talks a little bit about that, as well as unfair social, racial equity issues in the cannabis industry, uh, particularly related to women in cannabis, as well as talking to your kids about cannabis and some other topics. So it was a full podcast, really enjoyed meeting her inspired by the work she's doing and learned a lot. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Also, I wanted to let you know about our virtual holiday market that we are pulling together with other people in the women in the cannabis health area who have products or services that they'd like to market online this year because of COVID. Our options are limited for these holiday bazaars, whatnot. So we're going to do it online. So if you're interested in joining us, collaborating, sharing your ideas, send them our way. Reach out to admin at TSC Talks or contact us on one of our social media outlets. Message us however you want to get a hold of us. Reach out if you're interested in the virtual holiday market running from approximately Thanksgiving through Christmas. Also, our TSC Talks weekly updates. We've been doing these things. Now this will be our eighth weekly update this Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern on our TSC Talks Facebook page. So check that out. We do a rundown of the podcast, share some shout outs and announcements that we're looking for more of to get your news out there, your important moments, whatever it may be, as well as having a thought provoking discussion on some topic that we kind of go with the flow on. And my co-workers, Chris Nichols and partner Lisa Larson join the broadcast regularly and we hope to have more guests as well it's only 15 minutes every wednesday 3 p.m if you're interested in some randomness and fun join us and that is all i have for today so thanks again to kiara look for our virtual holiday market and check out our weekly updates and take it away kiara yeah so thanks for being on tsc talks and Kiara Juster, you are you are an attorney and you work have done work with the Last Prisoner Project and with uh, is it Richard Delisi? Is that the name? Correct, Richard Delisi. He's the longest serving nonviolent offender, cannabis offender, currently incarcerated in the in the United States. He's been in since 1988. Wow, yeah, I was just reading a little bit about that. That's just crazy. <laughs> So yeah, why don't you tell me a little bit about, give me a little bit of your background and. Yeah, well, I uh, grew, I was born in Northern California, but I grew up in Portland, Oregon from the time I was a toddler and ended up going to college in Oregon um, in a state where cannabis had been decriminalized since 1973. I actually grew up in Earl Blumenauer's district. I have a little, one of his little pins behind me. It's a, he gives them out on the hill. And um, wow. when I went to University of Oregon, obviously cannabis had always been part of the culture in Eugene. When I then went to the University of Miami for law school, it was a whole different oh world, God. particularly when it came to drug policy, to cannabis in particular, to harm reduction overall, and um, community investment as well. Wow, that must have been a shock to the system coming from a, such a progressive mindset state to Florida, you know, and it's a wide variety of people there. I won't say much yeah. about it because I don't know for sure, but. Uh, well, it was interesting for me coming from a, the land of, you know, re- reduce, reuse, recycle everything to a place where 
there wasn't <laughs> people weren't recycling at the time i was just flabbergasted i mean you're criminalizing <laughs> drugs and you're not recycling <laughs> and people litter it's just it, that was hard oh i bet uh, <laughs> yeah so how did what made you want to go to law school like what was your motivation for that and that's a long way from home right well um i didn't have the happiest childhood uh and i was told always that i should just be a lawyer um the you know that is i'm not the only one i think who felt a lot of pressure mm -hmm. to be a doctor or a lawyer and certainly medicine wasn't my thing i was a rebel uh by not going that route uh, and it, from a very early age, it was obvious that uh, thinking and, and reflecting more on issues was my thing. Mm -hmm. Going to law school, I was living in a whole nother place. Even my, even my coworkers and even my, you know, colleagues at the, at the university were very uh, much of a different mindset than we were on the West Coast. Um, and, I thought that I could make a difference in the war on drugs by becoming a prosecutor and focusing our efforts on violent crime and on pe keeping people safe because I had interned at the state attorney's office in law school uh, with somebody who was working incredibly violent, <laughs> the most violent, serious uh, murder cases that you wow. could think of. And he you know, would speak about the days when they had 3.3 murders a day and in, in Miami and um, and this very very violent war on drugs which was quite different than what I'd witnessed in the cannabis community on the west coast mm -hmm. and growing up not uh, looking at uh, drug policies very differently but also recognizing entheogens as as a, important um, products of nature and mm -hmm. cannabis in particular as an important medicine uh, my parents were physicians, and I knew that my mother's friends who were suffering from cancer and other things that are just are so hard on people and hard on families were finding relief through cannabis. So it oh. wasn't new to me. Um, right. But in Florida, the it continues, actually. Uh, even though they have medical cannabis in Florida, people continue to remain in the incarceral system there. Wow. They are not decarcerating like we've seen in other states. In fact, Richard is there in Florida. So you, okay, so you went to law school in Florida and then did you start, you started practicing there and did you do any, the prosecution, did you get involved in that? And mm -hmm. yeah, tell me a little bit. I about did. Um, I went straight into the state attorney's office after law school and thought that since you start out handling lower level crimes, mm -hmm. misdemeanors, that would be simple possessions. I thought that, that, hey, why can't we just focus on, on other things? I also saw how one encounter uh, was just really, one simple encounter was a gateway into things that you, know, you don't want to be led into, yeah. uh, which was the just criminal justice system in, in Miami at the time. And not just that, it was entire communities are devastated uh, who people don't choose to become victims of, in the war on drugs yet people are born into communities where they continue to be and i thought that we need to make a difference i also remember seeing a man once who was severely ill mm -hmm. and he was charged with possession and he'd been charged many times and it was so obvious that he needed cannabis and um, I withheld adjudication, even though it had been withheld before on him. Uh, I, I didn't even feel right doing that. I would have liked to just like rip up, rip up the file or shoved it in the ceiling as people had done in, in the previous years to get rid of cases. Um, <laughs> but we couldn't do that anymore. So uh, I never, I was not around in those days, but I, um, I had to give a withhold. And then being admonished for that was just shocking. Like this is, it, it, the fact of the matter is he should never have been arrested. He shouldn't have been in the courtroom that day. We were hurting people. And these encounters with the system, low level offenses, mm -hmm. are also a huge financial burden on the, on the taxpayer. Um, and I worry a little bit when we talk about 
decriminalizing versus legalizing that we're just creating a net of infractions, uh, you know, a net of, all right, it's just, it's just an infraction. Well, how many times is it just an infraction when we're just talking about decrim? And, um, and so you're still- saying go straight to legalization, not decrim, because there still will be charges. Is that correct? Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, I might be okay walking down the street and puffing on my J and get an infraction, but what about the person who I'm, I'm buying it from? And I'd like to know that, that our medicine is, is tested, is safe. Um, if you're not giving people an opportunity to produce medication safely, then what, what do you want? You know, I mean, we need to have policies that give people the opportunity to comply with the law. Otherwise, we're just criminalizing more behavior. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I had to be, I have a little experience from working for my ex who's an attorney and he was a bar advocate and, you know, taking a lot of cases in a very impoverished area. And I'd help him with the case files. I'd read through them. And, you know, if I just was like, these people are just set up to fail over and over and over again. You look at the rap sheets and they'd be like, you know, 10 pages long and a lot of them minor offenses, you know, but it just looked like they got into, to me, you know, and I, I'm not an attorney or, you know, as a lay person, it looked like they got, you know, you get into the system and you're on their radar and, you know, I don't know. It just seemed really unfair. So I, I don't know how that would be going from, you know, more of a progressive mindset and then ending up in Florida and um, well, not like you ended up there. Um, just what a different mindset I would think. So, yeah. And so you walked away from that. You walked away from the prosec- prosecute prosecuting cases and that must have been tough. No, it actually wasn't. I, I was, uh, I was, I cried every day when I started out as a prosecutor. I didn't want to be there. Um, I, I wanted to help people. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to hurt people. And there was a, there were many great opportunities to help people. There's a lot of serious crime out there that needs to be prosecuted. Sure. It was always hard though, to be in the courtroom with the defendant's mothers. I mean, every it's, it's hard. Crime, the justice system really creates victims out of family members as well. And um, I decided the day that I found out that I was carrying a child that I I I need, needed to do something. I didn't know what yet, um, but the thing I knew at that point that I needed to do was walk away and find a different path because obvi- I didn't feel like I was making the world that much better of a place with what I was doing. And I really felt the need to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I wanted to make sure, that this, sure this is a better place for all of our children. Um, and what I was witnessing every day was, was not uh, uh, creating a good environment for anyone, really. Yeah, it sounds like it. So what, so then from there, what you what made you kind of come back into, how did you get back into cannabis and talk about your, you know, from what I'm reading, it looks like you stepped away and did some, you know, figuring out what your next move was type thing. Um, I did. I, I stepped away and I was fortunate in that I was able to take my child and live internationally uh, in, a, in a couple other countries and examine drug policy from different perspectives and really look at cannabis in particular because I'd grown up on the West Coast. So cannabis was something, you know, that was not foreign to me in in high school. Um, I certainly didn't consume cannabis like I did once I started consuming cannabis medicinally and not taking any other medication in my late thirties. But it was, it was obvious to me as a, you know, even back in the 90s, that people behaved better on cannabis than when they were drinking, and that this was not a plant that should be stigmatized. Um, I, living overseas, was very sensitive to the fact that while we have a a war on drugs, which is really a war on, on black and brown people in our country, we've also taken that war overseas by making other countries sign on to treaties that have criminalized behavior that shouldn't be. And 
being on flights where they'd say that there was the death penalty for marijuana. I remember being on what? one once. Yes, in other countries, they do have the best death penalty for marijuana. And my daughter looked at me once and and I thought, I am for I need to make, I need to do something. I need to do something right this second. Um, and we basically did. Uh, I started advocating as much as possible I'd, um, and studying everything I could about the plant, about history, about policy, what works, what doesn't, why this plant is important. And I also really like history. So it, it's, the cannabis was really always on my mind. Mm -hmm. um, Always, ever since I um, found a book on growing in my mother's bookshelf. So it's never been far from my mind, which she doesn't grow now. She asks how, and it's just annoying, but yeah. <laughs> Parents, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm so, one of those. So. Yeah, so you came back, so you kind of came back and now you you got work, done work at Oaksterdam. Oaks Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I, in fact, was a student of Oaksterdam because okay. I wanted to learn everything about the plant, and that led me to okay. Oaksterdam. Okay, so that led you there. Which, yes, right around the time, this was like, this was, not, this was 2017, and they had their 10-year anniversary that year. Um, Oaksterdam was a school that was founded back in 2007, where Richard Lee wanted if people wanted to learn how to grow they also had to learn how to advocate mm -hmm. and there's so much more to learn about this plant and in order to legislate effectively we need to educate effectively we can educate we can advocate and then we can legislate and being at Oaksterdam with so many other people seeking that knowledge and, um, and who give their heart and soul to this plant I really felt at home um, and I was at home and not long after I started working for Oaksterdam and working on policy and working on spreading the word about the truth of this plant because I think that that is really important. I think we need to have honesty at all levels, whether we're just being honest with our kids or we're being honest with the public as electeds. I think uh, that an honest analysis of everything is incredibly important. And that is founded in, in truthful education based on science. Wow. So um, your work with Oaksterdam and how did you get into the last prisoner project? Well, um, Oaksterdam is great and it's now online virtual, which yeah. is super great. So I, yeah, I, I didn't want to cut away from still. it. Yeah. So no, you, it's, it's okay. <laughs> I, I'm enjoying it during the, during uh, COVID <laughs> instead of, um, well, basically, I'm able to go to class, and and it's really inspiring to see people join globally. That there are people all over, all over this planet, learning about this plant and learning about the business of cannabis, and also learning about horticulture. And mm -hmm. it's 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 really when there's so much gloominess in the world, it's so nice seeing people who are growing their minds and growing flowers. And Last Prisoner Project is an organization that I was a huge fan of um, from the time I first heard about it. I had in fact wanted to do something similar uh, because I just found it wrong that we have a whole industry where people are making money on the backs of those legacy yeah. operators and traditional market operators or original market operators, however you, you want to put it. We are not successful as an industry if people remain incarcerated. Uh, many people for simply being patient. Um, and we can't forget the fact that you get, you know, cannabis is, uh, it's a, it's a, it can be used as a pipeline to prison for many people. It's not mm -hmm. a gateway drug to other things, um, but they, it certainly is something that has been used to criminalize the normal, normal behavior of, of many. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it seems just unfathomable that, you know, that we're, we take it for granted what, how that we could go to the dispensary and, you know, light up a joint and whatnot. And there's people that are still in prison for, you know, for marijuana related, related crimes. It's hard to carry that around, you know, 
Um, so I, exactly. I, you know, I don't think about it, but in, I mean, when you're working in that, in that field in, as an attorney or, you know, in, in advocating like that, you're, it's in your face. So uh, yeah, that's gotta be heavy and hard to, mm -hmm. hard to navigate. I mean, and you have to give it to Steve D'Angelo who could just you know, run Harbor side and be successful and not care about others and not be a good community partner when it comes to helping out our incarcerated population. But I think that more people could follow his example and not feel like they are truly successful if they aren't doing everything they can to help decarcerate prisoners of the drug war. And Steve D'Angelo founded Last Prisoner Project. I, I work with a lot of really great women in Last Prisoner Project, but it was in fact Steve who used his success from Harborside to launch this wonderful nonprofit. What we try to do, and I'm a legal advisor for Last Prisoner Project. Um, okay. It's not, I don't work for them, I'm a legal advisor. And mm -hmm. everybody is working to decarcerate uh, the cannabis victims of the drug war and basically put themselves out of business. We, we don't want last prisoner project to exist. Right. We want right. them all to be out. Yeah. And what, what a great day that will be. Yes. Uh, but there are many great hardworking attorneys at over volunteering their time at last prisoner project. If you'd like to get involved, go over to last prisoner okay. org. There's also a lot of ways for everybody to be involved. Um, even down, you know, your, the bud tenders, you can wear a special last prisoner project pin. You can spread the word. Um, if you own a dispensary, yeah. you can round up and donate to last prisoner project. And you know what? It doesn't have to be last prisoner project. The fact of the matter is if you are operating a business in cannabis, you need to think about all of those people who remain incarcerated for this plant or whose lives have been affected by the criminal justice system because of the criminalization of a plant and do what we can to help one another and do what we can to facilitate easy transitions out of prison because it's hard enough on in the best of days. Right. And these really are some of the worst we've seen, definitely. So we need to do what we can to help people. We also need to remove barriers to participate in the cannabis industry because how hypocritical is, is it to preclude those who help build this industry from participating? So, and we also need to make sure that there are measures that help make this a more equitable industry because what I see in some states with very limited licenses, with a bunch of barriers, huge, huge, huge hills to climb to even apply for a license. Yeah. I don't think that that's equitable. And just because something's equal doesn't mean it's equitable, equitable. by any stretch. Yeah, for sure. Um, I appreciate your passion so much. I, I wanted to ask you a question about the decarceration. Now, how does that work? How did the actual nuts and bolts of when somebody is, what do you do to move the system along and get them out? You apply for clemency, really. I uh -huh. mean, that's where we're at with Richard um, and that's what we're hoping for. And you just hope it happens before people who are old and in poor health contract a virus that will, will take them down. And so we're, we're hoping every day that Richard is safe. So to decarcerate, basically, um, it means to get out of, of prison. Um, and there are, are various routes, I mean, a whole, pro, a whole appellate process. But for Richard, where he is in the process is that we are asking Governor DeSantis to have compassion and grant clemency to Richard. So what's the time? So yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So we, you apply for clemency and then it goes through an investigative process and then it goes before the board and all of that can take years. And yeah. Richard is set to be released June 27th, I believe, 2022. Um, and with gain time, that could be even sooner. Mm -hmm. But he is, he's already served over 32 years. He is old and he is in poor health. He has five grandchildren he'd love to spend oh. time with. Um, time that is, you know, who knows how Precious. much time and any of us have. True, true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for explaining that. You know, I think um, that kind of goes into your work with the NCIA, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. 
Yeah, you are the head of that, and that's the national. No, 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 no. Khadija Adams is the head of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Khadija's great. I am on the committee, Uh and I co-chair the uh, messaging subcommittee um, Uh with with Kelsey Middleton. And Tiffany is on the committee as well, who did the events. for what does that event. what does that work look like? What what do you, does it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what is that? Well, I think everybody on that committee believes that this industry needs to be doing everything yeah. we can to be as um, I would say, like it should go with. We shouldn't even have to say that we need to be a diverse, equitable, inclusive industry. Like, do we really need to say it? <laughs> but apparently, we do. Uh, and particularly when we look at the statistics in cannabis as far as leadership and ownership, it is, it is men, it is white men. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we look at historical barriers um, to capital, um, those are historically barriers that are placed upon everybody except white men. Uh, and therefore, we need to make sure that we do everything we can to reduce the barriers to entry and to make sure that this industry represents those who who represents the, all of us who are cannabis consumers and not just just people with money, white white men men, and not just people who can afford to. And I think that as an industry association, we have an obligation to make sure that we're inclusive and make sure that we're doing everything um, to make this the best industry possible. Um, I also think that in this day and age, we need to think about the burdens being placed particularly on women um, who are have lost their jobs at twice the rate of men, I've been reading, really? and are assuming the burden of, I mean, I can't even say lost their jobs, unable to go back to their jobs because caring for loved ones, caring for parents, caring for children, um, we all call it a joy, but it truly is a burden during a pandemic, and particularly for those who are trying to work at the same time. So I, I'm really worried about how those, how that reality is going to affect um, the cannabis industry. And also when we're taking such an economic hit all over the place, who is going to take that hit the hardest? Those who have the least the amount least. of capital to float them through. And when you're a I really see this um, as potentially catastrophic to minority participation in the industry. And therefore, all this industry association, I believe every industry needs to be doing what they can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You hit on a bunch of really scary situations. You know, I think the burden on the families and particularly women, I thought it was really, well, not interesting, but you know, with the remote learning, uh, all of a sudden, you know, you're expected to kind of, as a parent, there's no, you know, to step into that role and help your child access the remote learning. And that's, you know, I don't care how smart your kid is. It's not going to be, you're going to have some bumps in the road and it takes time and your energy away from, you know, whatever your career is or whatnot. So I, uh, yeah, it just seems like, of course, that's going to fall mostly on women and the people that yeah. don't have the resources, like you just said. So it I, reduces your bandwidth in every way, yeah. like even, you know, your emotional bandwidth. Yeah. And your yeah. bandwidth. Yeah. And your bandwidth mm-hmm. when everybody's on at the same time. It's just a lot to juggle. Um, and I think it's important for parents to be open and honest about cannabis with their kids. I yeah. think when we demonize something, we really are doing an injustice. And when we lie to our kids about something like cannabis, how can they ever trust us about anything ever again? So I think that it's important for women to destigmatize cannabis consumption and be open about the choices they make, wellness, medical, whatever. It's their choice. They can do what they want. And we should not stigmatize people who consume cannabis and particularly those who make the wise decision to choose cannabis over alcohol. Cause one Absolutely. is a poison and kills lots of people every year. And one has never ever killed anyone. 
Uh, yeah, that's another hot issue. It's just the way we've normalized alcohol consumption and cannabis is actually healthy, but <laughs> so many barriers to the mentality shifted in that. You know, I think you've covered most of what I, I wanted to get out, but um, as far as challenges personally, what has been as a female, any experiences that you wanted to highlight that are have been exceptionally challenging or just? Um, I'd say in law more than cannabis. And okay. um, there was a lot of sexual harassment. And for a bit of time, I chalked that up to being a, a young lady in her early 20s in Miami. But it became very clear that that wasn't it a lot of it just came back to in the legal profession i felt like there was a lot of harassment as well as alcohol abuse really and in cannabis i have made many friends of all over the place and never really felt uncomfortable um, like i was every single time i went out in miami to every single happy hour every single legal event there was always something, always, without fail, that made me feel uncomfortable. Ugh. In cannabis, I feel like we respect each other's minds, although I've heard otherwise from some people. Um, I think that in cannabis, there still is a collective of cannabros who think that, you know, Mary Jane is only their girlfriend, and they <laughs> can dictate how this plant should be uh, sold to everyone else, and who, you know, I know that as a 40 year old woman, I've walked into plenty of dispensaries and been judged completely the wrong way, which is, I don't, I mean, it's always interesting to me um, to see how people are judged, however they look when they walk into a place, uh, because this is a plant I, I love. It's a plant that's been um, off and on part of my life for mm -hmm. o over a quarter century. Um, and uh, I think that there is room for improvement in patient relations at dispensaries. Oaksterdam does have a bud tending program, um, but I, I think that, it, that bud tenders can play such a special role in huh. education. And for me, when I, I'd spent time, I still go to Amsterdam every year, except this year to spend time just processing and I'm enjoying it. And I used to observe a coffee shop and, and cannabis culture and um, in different ways. And in the United States, a few years ago, I actually was able to have really good relationships with some bartenders at a certain dispensary. Mm -hmm. And we were able to share knowledge and like learn collaboratively. And that, that was such a wonderful experience. Um, I used to refer everyone over there uh, and, um, that's a level of, of care that I don't often see. Yeah. And that is necessary. And what I do see and I'm seeing less of is the cannabro culture, is the bud babes, like cannabis being marketed to women in ways that I doesn't appeal to me. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we've also seen an evolution in cannabis merchandising. It's, uh, I think that there, that cannabis, we all consume cannabis. That means that um, not everybody wants to wear, you know, a shirt with a giant leaf on it. Maybe some of us just want a tiny diamond necklace. <laughs> so there's, it, it's evolved, but um, yeah, yeah, I, I've been happy to, I, with the bud I, tender. Yeah, you feel that um, role I, is really important. I mean, I've heard. I think, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess in Massachusetts, my experience with bud tenders has been variable but I don't rely on them for anything. You know, I come in knowing what I want, knowing what I'm, but when I first came in, they were more helpful when I first was learning, but just not, not a high level of knowledge, I would say. Either that or they're just not getting the respect that, I don't know, it seems like a tough role, a tough to, yeah, so. Well, it's tough to navigate. And what I witnessed, I mean, the one time I was out there when I visited the sensory, it was very different than, you know, on the West Coast, particularly in Oregon, yeah. when you don't have any lines, you can go in and like, you get to know your, your bud tethered. Really? 
Uh, there's a security at the door. You just okay. walk in, um, and it's more, you know, you op- before COVID, you'd open the jar and smell it, and uh-huh. you know, it's it's it's, it's not about more how much can we sell in a short amount of time, right? It's about how can we make sure that this person has received their medication in the best possible way, mm-hmm. and that includes education. And so even if they don't have the time, even if you only have five minutes, a customer, and, and that's sad because I've had a great, uh, you, generally I become friends with my attenders and then we'll, we'll talk for hours later, but uh, <laughs> you need to have information that you can distribute. Mm-hmm. People need to know how to use best use this plant for them. Um, I'm also a huge advocate of home grow. I think people need to grow this plant for them because I know that on the regulated market in most states, I could not afford to be a patient. And um, that is really scary because I don't want to just pay minor co-pays and have to take pills. I Uh, want to make the best decisions for my body. Yeah. Yeah. We just, uh, my partner and I just, he started to grow and basically for that reason, it's just too expensive. I'm I'm moving some of my offspring to using cannabis and, considering that too i i'm like there's no way we can afford this so uh, and it, it's so it's been so great to learn you know you're kind of forced to learn in order to do it and um yeah it's really been awesome that part of it um, and you know like what you said with explaining to your kids i wanted to circle back to that how do you go about how do you go you say you have you have a daughter i did i haven't asked her age i think i might have last time but how is how what's your thoughts on that how do you explain it do you just go right for it uh well she's 10 and so that conversation has evolved yeah but i think that it started i think that it probably first started not drug specific but with the conversation uh, when we moved back to the united states that i told her that what they tell you in school isn't always going to be the truth (laughs) Um, that there, that we don't, uh, and she's, you know, just shocked. I'm like, they, you know, they might tell you in math, they're going to tell you the truth <laughs> in science. Let's hope that they tell you the truth, Not kind of but in other, other topics, um, they might not. And that's why we're always going to have to be learning. And the conversation about cannabis from the time she was, uh, you know, we started, well, she watched me study cannabis and she's, she, it, it's not something um, foreign to her. And if you ask her now, she probably doesn't remember a time when it wasn't a part of, part almost of you. Her, you know, our everyday, our everyday life because it has been for so long. Um, but I told her that with cannabis, when later on people might, you know, offer her cannabis or whatever. And she thinks that like the people who consume cannabis are like, us you know so she's like who who are these old moms are going to come around and like be offering me cannabis (laughs) and i'm like no no i assure you it's not just parents right um it's kids too and when they say that what you say is no it's not yet because it's going to happen you're going to you're going to consume cannabis um you know kids are going to kids are going to consume cannabis they're going to have sex it's going to happen um but there are things that you don't want to happen too young. Um, and for me, alcohol and cannabis are both substances that I prefer she wait for. Mm-hmm. Too. Um, but I know that there, um, there are mixed views about the studies on uh, brain development or mm-hmm. using anything before you're 25. And I can speak from personal, personal experience and say uh, my brain wasn't fully developed before I was 25. Um, I would probably not have become a prosecutor and probably not have gotten married uh, if my brain were fully developed at that age. So, um, yeah, I can circle back to in, some, yeah. Yeah, but it, I think that cannabis is not um, something that I'm saying absolutely don't ever try that about, like I am with most substances. Right. You know, absolutely not. Don't even take a Tylenol unless you absolutely have to um, and with my child she's wanted to be an astronaut uh, her entire life wow and nasa has a no cbd policy oh. so um her big thing is 
she just hopes that she never falls out of a tree or suffers any sort of brain injury because she knows how I feel about about substances being neurogenerative and neuroprotective. And, That's great. Um, she knows that. That's cool. She knows it, and she doesn't want to use cannabis um, if it would mm-hmm. ever preclude her from being hired by NASA. So, um, so it's so she's the hard line there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, it's 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 been tough with my kids too, just because I kind of came to it a little late. So, you know, backtracking and explaining that it's that it you know they've been indoctrinated in school and stuff up until the last year or so that it's bad and, and you know just in fact my son who has a slight intellectual disability and he's the one that I'm kind of transitioning to cannabis is funny he's. <laughs> He said something like, you know, I, I don't think he realized what was in the medicine because I put it in, I, you know, have a tincture or whatever. He didn't know that it was, can't, that that was the same thing as like marijuana that he's hearing about. And so he said something funny, like something real negative that, you know, he was repeating. And I'm like, hey, that's what you take. And he's like, all of a sudden, like his, it's like he started to understand, you know, because he can feel the, the positive effects of it and he, can, he feels better. But he didn't realize, you know, that marijuana, you know, all the things were, you know, he's hearing this one thing and then, but yeah, I've seen him like speak, take it on himself and, you know, explain it to people. So that's pretty cool. Well, I think that's really brave of you. And um, like I said about the below 25 thing, um, it's easy to tell your kid, you know, not now, not yet. But if your kid needs medicine, you find that medicine. Yeah. And I understand, you know, there are parents out there who are giving pediatric patients really high doses because that's what their bodies need. And my child asked me to come to school last year for career day. And she asked me to oh. speak specifically about interstate commerce and cannabis. Um, <laughs> and she wanted me to tell all of the kids how horrible it is that we don't that we have uh, a medicine that helps some of some kids she knows not have seizures anymore at least not have them control their life so she knows kids who are able to flourish and thrive because of cannabis but they can't drive to go see their own grandparents because they can't take their medicine into uh, idaho or someplace like that Uh and uh so for her, she said, mommy, please, can you please talk to them That's about so cool. how, the, how those, those kids need their cannabis? And she understands how it is a medicine for people and that it doesn't matter what your age is, it's, it can be a medicine, yeah. an effective medicine, and how we need to remove restrictions on simple things like elementary school students being able to visit their grandparents when they need to take medicine. Yeah, you yeah, have very well put, yeah. That's pretty cool that she asked you to do that, though, that she's thought that through and that that would be something that would really be helpful for her peers to hear. Good job. I spoke about kombucha instead, how kombucha is taxed like alcohol, but really shouldn't be. (laughs) But maybe in a few years, it maybe in a few years, I'll talk, you know, uh, it was like there were, it's a concern. It's, but we need to talk to kids about cannabis policy. I think so. I agree. Um, I think it's really important and I am scared about any sort of, of, um, I'm just scared about telling our kids the truth. I'm just scared about what's being taught if it's not math and science, even if it is science nowadays being factual. In fact, I'm worried about the numbers being factual nowadays too. Tell me. Got a lot of worries. It's a, it's a, it's such a confusing time. I, I agree. Yeah, uh, yeah. This has been awesome. I I just want to just say how much I appreciate your passion for bringing everybody along. I guess you know it's not fair that just certain people are allowed access to this plant that can really transform our world. So. Thank you for the work you're doing. And yeah, do you have anything else you want to share or anything you want to pitch? I mean, where can people find you? Oaksterdam University. Yeah, tell yeah. me. Yeah, well, I just want to thank you because we all need to, you know, we have a moral imperative to decarcerate and also to spread um, health and wellness. And this plant is a plant of health and wellness. 
um, and happiness that I think can have a really transformative effect on so many levels of our society, economically, health-wise. I just think that this is a really special, um, sustainable plant. Um, and you guys can find me at um, on Instagram. It's Kiara T N W. And if you're interested in Last Prisoner Project, you can head head over to lastprisonerproject.org. And if you wouldn't mind going to Free Delisi, F R E E D E L I S I dot com, there's information on what you can do to help Richard. Cool. Um, but I also encourage all of you to find whatever organization sings the song of your heart and do what you can to support it. There's everybody can be active in policy from their homes um, right now. And if you are interested in, in Oak Stream University, the next semester starts in January, although there's always content online and that's mm -hmm. oakstreamuniversity.com. You can join me for high tea Tuesdays at 420 Pacific Tuesdays on Oaksterdam social media. And also for, um, caregiver content, parents and children alike. Uh, my friend Amy Mothercraft, Amy Mothercraft on Instagram, has a great programming all um, by parents who are in the industry. Um, I'm at Mountain Mama Mondays at three o'clock uh, cool. doing really fun crafts. We're gonna do um, volcano pumpkins this week, but it's great because there are a lot of parents who are caregivers. Um, and who incorporate cannabis into really their own self-care, which is important. And so um, we have people talking about ways to relax um, when you have been moving around your child all day because perhaps um, they aren't able to manage their bodies on their own or are communicating with nonverbal um, children. It's really, oh, that's cool. really special that I'm glad that Amy's doing that because I know that, yeah. that we, we need to be helping all parents right now. and. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for those. Um, yeah. And you're on your podcast. What do you, High Tea Tuesdays, do you, you have new guests every week? So you're just getting people's stories or. Yes. Well, it's interesting. The last few months I've been a little policy focused, talking a lot about more. I'm hoping for the vote in oh, September. Yeah. And now it's like, I don't want to talk about more anymore, but we're talking about it still. Um, but I, it, there's all sorts of different topics. I'm just okay. Week, I'll have um, the building fellow from Students for Sensible Drug Policy on. That's an organization I'm very passionate about. I think we need to be looking beyond cannabis and at other sensible drug policies and harm reduction and um, policing policies as well. So I'm excited that Robert's coming on and my brain is going to fail me soon. Uh, for Halloween, we have creepy crawlies and pathogens with, uh, yeah, but all sorts of really great okay. um, talks. My first guest, actually, David Bienenstock just rejoined me. I think it was last week. And so it was great to talk to David about the Cannabis Voters Project. If anybody needs to check their registration, please do that immediately. And also go to Cannabis Voters Project to see where all of the elected and those who are running for office stand on cannabis issues. Ooh, good. That's a great tip. Oh, awesome. All right, Kiara, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, you for all you're doing. We need more mothers out there who are representing and championing their kids because it's the stories, it's stories from you that change minds and stories really are the best way to create new policy by changing minds through those stories about how for you, how it helps your, your offspring um, and why you feel it's important and why we need to have safer access, less restrictive access, and also uh, remove the hurdles to scientific research. Yeah. Yeah. In a nutshell, that's what we need. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Kiara. All right. Thank you. Yes. Bye. so much to Kiara Jester for coming on and giving such an awesome education, information on the legal system, all things attorney related. Uh, stay tuned for our virtual holiday market as well as our TSC Talks weekly updates every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on our Facebook page. And that is it for today. Over.